Hi, and welcome to The Plugged In Show. I'm Paul Acey. Talk to your parents or your grandparents about the good old days. When and I was here. your age. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. They'll tell you about how they walked to school for 12 miles. Uphill both ways. Uphill both ways. Barefoot. Snowing all the uh-huh. time after, of course, milking the cows. Right, pulling their 14 yeah. siblings in a sled. <laughs> Because the siblings right. were all lazy. <laughs> my, my dad actually did that, but but that's another, I wasn't that's another thing. <laughs> <laughs> but the times, they are a-changing. According to a study released last month by the Pew Research Center, many teens and adults alike say that it's harder to be a teen than it used to be. Uh, w- that's one of the things that, that teens and adults can actually agree on. Mm. Um, and more often than not, mm. why do they say that it's harder? Technology. You get the prize. I figured. I like getting prizes. (laughs) And on this show, while we're talking about technology, we'll turn our attention to a few robots in disguise. That's right. The latest Transformers movie (laughs) is coming out this weekend. It's called Transformers 1. But first, let's talk about teens and technology and whether the latter is making it tougher on our kids. And to get that conversation underway, we'll talk to two experts in this field who you've already heard from, Mm -hmm. Jonathan McKee. And Adam Holtz. Hey, everybody. Yeah. Glad to be here. Yeah, I probably should have said hi. That's all right. Hey, guys. It's all good. Whatever the producers say, we're fine. Do. <laughs> You're fine. You just roll, man. It was fine. Right. Was, I think we just roll smoothly. with this take exactly as it is, and people can understand <laughs> it's not always That's perfect. Right. I like it. I kind of like it. Okay. Ragged. Sounds good to all me. All right. So let me ask you a quick question before we begin. Here is your favorite part of the podcast, the icebreaker. I love this part. I love I'm so excited. (laughs) So in a lot of ways, our kids never knew a world without the internet. We all did. We all grew up in a time Mm. before the internet. Our formative years took place before the internet was even a thing heard of, even thought of. Uh, So in that vein, think back and when you were talking with your parents or your grandparents and they talked about what it was like growing up, what blew your mind about how ancient it felt. Jonathan, I want to hear from you. Man, it's, it's, you know, with my dad and my mom, it was, is, you know, I always try to squeak in listeners. You know, this, I try to squeak in more than one answer. This is my, <laughs> plan. Um, I, I, my mom and dad have different answers. My dad, it blew me away the TV because his parents were a little late bloomers on getting a TV even. He was born in uh, 41, and so there weren't a lot of TVs around, but by the time he was a teenager, a lot of his friends had TVs. He still didn't, and so he would kind of paint the picture of how he, like, his family would sit around the radio and listen to, like, a story (laughs) told on the radio, and I just thought that was so bizarre. And now, granted, I mean, this this is kind of a cool podcast. All three of us sitting here we were all born within one year's time of each other. One I mean, year's we were all born time. I mean, talk s- about s- a good year. We Holy could. cow. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, it is. I mean, we were all, and we're not going to tell the listeners when that was, but the three of us were all born I'm gonna tell them. within one year of each other. And uh, and it, so, so I mean, we kind of know that era well. And for us, I mean, like I grew up, my first TV was a black and white TV, yep. but we had a TV. Um, and it didn't matter when I watched Gilligan's Island because it was black and white in it. That's right. <laughs> so, so, so I was like, oh, wait, this is black and white. Uh, or was it? Anyway, but but it, but it, th- that's the kind of stuff, though, that, you know, th- that really hit me. But my mom, what my mom shared truly blew me away. And that was that their first house didn't have a bathroom. They oh, my house. goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's so they actually would go stunning. To, they would go to an outhouse. You know, and they had this outhouse back there, but they talked about what, you know, what that was like. And, and it was just, it just kind of made me kind of feel like, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, privileged in a mm-hmm. way, it, you know, kind of, kind of like to see, and we would go and visit relatives, some of those old houses to see what's, you know, of course, no AC, none of that kind of stuff. And um, so, yeah, it made me feel, I don't know, kind of like, wow. We're blessed to have what we have. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, Jonathan, you actually kind of stole my thunder, but I'm going to get over it. I'm going to shake it off. I gave seven Shake answers. it off. Yeah. So my mom was born in 1953, mm-hmm. so a little bit younger than your parents, and they had me when I was very young, and they were 12. very young too, right? Uh, yeah, uh, 17 actually, just for the record. Um, yeah. She was born on a small farm in Iowa, and they had no indoor plumbing. 
1953. Yeah. So not only was there an outhouse, there was just the old proverbial pump with the well and you'd go out. I mean, honestly, yeah. it's like what you see on National Geographic of women going to the well to get water for yeah. the day. And yeah. I, yeah. I can't even comprehend the work that my grandmother must have done because they had oh, four man. kids on a farm and farms are filthy, you know, in the best way. You work hard, you get very dirty and doing dishes and doing laundry by hand. Yeah. I mean, forget having to use an outhouse, just the rest of it. 1953. I know, 1953. It's not that long ago. And, you know, yeah. I don't feel like we were a third world country but it you know when i tell the story it kind of sounds like it it's kind of yeah, crazy just sure. how much things have changed oh, just man. just in really a few decades right yeah. so so my lingering memory and i i think that also my dad probably grew up on a farm that didn't have plumbing at least mm -hmm. originally um so i think that that was that was something that definitely i can relate to but the thing that struck me the most when i was a kid i was talking with my grandma about her icebox. Yeah. You know, because yeah, yeah. Yeah. where you actually it was just really had, an icebox. It was really an <laughs> icebox. You had this guy who delivered these huge blocks of ice every week, stuck them in the bottom of this big old box to keep your stuff cool. Yeah. So yeah. every every week, just when the milk was being delivered, there would be an ice delivery guy. Yeah. It was incredible. Well, and, and, and in Phoenix, Arizona, did that guy come by every three hours? <laughs> no doubt. Seriously, I, mean, you, I, I cannot imagine how people lived in Phoenix back in the day. Well, and, and I'm sure that all of you have memories of relatives who did this, but that entire Depression generation, they didn't buy anything. They didn't spend anything, and they kept yeah. everything. My grandmother would wash out mm -hmm. Ziploc bags. She would reuse tinfoil we had yep. an entire, oh, sure. she had an entire pantry full of Fleischmann's margarine containers. And, um, you know, that, just that it's the disposable culture that we have now. They kept everything. Well, and I got to be honest with you. My, my mom also grew up washing out plastic bags. My oh, sure. wife took up that habit we wash out plastic bags now because it feels wasteful just to but throw it's them because out, right? of the depression yeah i yeah. mean that's where it came from mm -hmm. absolutely yeah so well isn't it funny like the other day i wanted to bring i can't remember who i wanted to bring some food and it wasn't to like my daughter it was like a neighbor or something a gerbil and i was like asking my <laughs> and i was asking my wife i'm like hey do we have any butter containers do we have any you know because i grew up with you always had them. Container. Yeah. Or always. Or a Cool Whip container, right? <laughs> cool you know, Whip. perfect. <laughs> Shout to out to Cool to Whip. someone because you could absolutely give it away. And who cares? It was a Cool Whip container. <laughs> now all we have is like, you know, like literally these things that I've bought that are like Rubbermaid or whatever. Yeah. And Lori's like, well, we can't do that because then we'd have to get it back. And I didn't have a portable <laughs> yeah. container. How right? sad That's in our really lives of privilege point. is that I don't even have a single butter container in my house. <laughs> I want the portable back so All I can right. give away something. Maybe All this right? is the best icebreaker ever. I just want to <laughs> so, say that. We got to get on the podcast, but I do have one quick question. Do you guys save your grease? Do you have like a like a tin no. can that you pour your no. grease no, in? No, but all of my relatives did. Okay. We still so have I'm, that I'm familiar with it. You know, I wonder whether we're actually living in some sort of time warp where it's the 1950s at our house because you know, yeah we save our grease you know if you watch tv it wasn't that bad a time you know that that's a question i never <laughs> ever thought would be asked on the podcast do you save do your, you save grease? your <laughs> grease i mean that is i've been saving it for 36 years we have a we have a 20 gallon vat in the garage we've collected all our grease see all that right. right there in the bottom all right. <laughs> right. it's kind of so... and we've now lost every listener under the age of 60 so, Paul, why so, don't you press on? So that speaking. was from when I made bacon in 1972. <laughs> don't light it on fire either because it'll burn a long time. Yeah. Oh, and now back man. to Paul. So speaking of Greece, <laughs> <laughs> you did this study, right? Said said that It had nothing to do with Greece, did it? <laughs> nothing to do okay, with Greece. Nothing checking. at all. <laughs> Greece has not made teens' lives harder. But yeah. you know what has? Technology. Microplastics? <laughs> no. No. We right. gotta get to the podcast. We do. Okay. We do. Excluding Sha Na Na. It made their lives very Sixty nine percent of parents say it's harder to be a teen today than it was twenty years ago. 
Teens, who weren't even around 20 years ago, of course, tend to agree. 44% say that it's harder with them uh, than, than it was for their parents to be a teen. Now, 29% say it's unsure. That, that ratio is a little bit down, obviously, from parents, but the, that's still the biggest answer that teens gave. It's harder to be a teen today than it was 20 years mm. ago. Well, what do they know? <laughs> Well, exactly. I mean, exactly. I'm just being they don't I mean, know. Like, they didn't walk to school. They didn't save ago. Greece. They're like, I heard. <laughs> I mean, how do they even know? They didn't you have to ride their bikes to school. Twenty years old or over. I mean, don't ask a fourteen-year-old right. how it was twenty years ago. Right, Jonathan, <laughs> you're you're, you're undermining but, the whole premise but, of this podcast. Let's let's plow on here. <laughs> Meanwhile, only thirty-five. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, only 39% of teens point to some aspect of technology, while 31% blame more pressures and expectations. Parents, meanwhile, about two-thirds of them say that that technology is to blame for their kids having a harder mm. time. And the biggest culprit, social media. Uh, that darn yeah, social sure. media. That darn social media. Yeah. Um, so, Adam, yeah. as the dad, as of three current teens. Three current yeah. teens. Yeah. What do you think? Is it harder for teens today to be a teen, or, um, or is it easier? And what do your teens think? I think it's harder. I, I agree with the research. And as I was thinking about this podcast, I think there are a number of reasons. I suspect we'll have a fairly robust conversation about technology uh, as this conversation unfolds, because that's part and parcel of what has changed in our culture. But I think the heart of much of the teen experience is trying to figure out where you fit in. Mm. And so teens are by nature comparative creatures, right? And it used to be when I was growing up back in the Stone Age, an example, and I've probably given this example before, when there was a big concert in town, there were always the lucky kids that had the money and the resources to go and those who didn't. It was kind of the haves and the have nots, right? And you always represented your privilege if you got to go by getting a concert t-shirt. And you mm. always wore your t-shirt to school the day after yeah, the concert sure. to signify- You were there. I'm a cool kid. Right. We yep. could do this, right? Yep. Yep. I think the internet and social media in particular takes that comparison dynamic and blows it out to infinity. It's not just Absolutely. an occasional yeah. special event. It's not just mm -hmm. the kid that you know they come from money and their dad's a lawyer and they drive a Lexus or a Porsche or whatever. Like there, there've always been material signifiers of privilege or things that we aspire to culturally. But now we have these accounts where everybody is putting their best self online constantly. And that, I think, is, is compounded by the fact that, at least in, in our world where we've lived, one of the unintended um, consequences of school choice is you have people going to school maybe 20 minutes from their neighborhoods. And so I grew up in a neighborhood where you went to school with the kids that you lived with. It was all a unified mm -hmm. experience. But now if you're in a, a large suburban area... Um, you've got kids that are isolated. Mm -hmm. The result is mm -hmm. they may not be able to hang out or walk to Johnny's house or whatever because Johnny lives 25 minutes away. Sure. Um, all of that has led, I think, to more isolation when finally combined with the information technology, we're all afraid of the world, right? right. We, we all yeah. know more than mm -hmm. we did in 1980. And so you're afraid to let your kids take risks. And so the result is you've got your kids on lockdown at home, even apart from COVID. They're on their devices just looking at the great lives that everybody else is living. And so it's no surprise to me that one of the outcomes seems to be higher anxiety, more depression, a sense of isolation, and in extreme cases, you know, suicidal ideation. Yeah, yeah. Jonathan, I know you talk to parents a ton when you go out to conferences and whatnot. Are, does that resonate with you? Do you? Are you hearing the same sort of things from the parents that you talk with? Yeah, I mean, and and one thing I'll just I gotta lay out this disclaimer here. You know, when we ask, I kind of want to narrow it to talking about the technology and the pressures. Exactly what the research was saying from the peer report: the pressures and expectations we put on kids. Because I think the blanket statement of "is it better for kids today?" I think for three 
white guys to sit here and have this conversation. I'm just I'm just gonna say it the way it is. I, I think I think there's some things that I think we've made great strides for racial equality, that kind of stuff. And so I'd love to hear from our listeners, you know, hey, what do you think? I think for me to sit there and go, oh yeah, it's much worse. I think we've made some great strides and I don't want to ignore those strides. Sure. But in the areas of so let I just want to throw that out there. In the areas of technology and the pressures and expectations we're putting on kids, absolutely. I feel that that is worse. And I think that our listeners uh, would would say across the board, across socioeconomic lines, across racial lines, that pressure is across yeah. all young people today. Because just like Adam said, you know, where it used to be in 19, you know, 80, whatever, if, hey, look, they're wearing the police synchronicity, you know, tour shirt, you know, or whatever. That was the thing, you know, that you're like, you, everybody knew, but now everybody has got the t-shirt and it's in right. their back pocket. And the interesting thing as a, as a person who worked, I was three decades in youth ministry. And so spending time on campuses, you know, this decade with young people and seeing that those devices in the back pockets are across socioeconomic lines, racial lines. Uh, as a matter of fact, in a lot of the studies, often, believe it or not, if you look at the studies, you can break it down by socioeconomic. And sometimes actually poorer families, kids are more likely to spend more screen time. Mm. So this isn't something where only sure. the elite, just stating it out there, where only the elite who can afford a, you know, a TV or a phone have it. No, that we've managed to just kind of get the phone in everybody's pocket. Let me just well, say it like that. And and you do sort of think, even when you're talking about that that socioeconomic line that you're talking about, you know, more affluent families can afford extracurricular activities for yeah. their kids. That totally yeah. makes sense to me. Where where maybe the the the, the main entertainment outlet for, for a lot of families is the TV, is their yeah. phone. Well and, yeah. and the sing and the single mom who's working super hard to try to put you know, dinner on the table, she's not home till six. And what do the kids do? Sure. They come home, they're on their devices. They're spending more time because they're kind of unsupervised that way. It happens. It's just, it, and sadly, um, we have a, our entire culture, all kids are are facing these pressures. So that being said, that was kind of laying the groundwork for the discussion. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we are just seeing this uptick in anxiety. And we've talked about this in even recent podcasts uh, where we talk like the Jonathan Haidt you know, new book discussion about about that. Yep. He did some amazing research about yeah. how how do you just how do you explain the anxiety that's 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 been raising pretty much since the time that these devices got in our back pocket. Since social media specifically has gotten our back pocket, 2012 ish, we've started to see this more. And you'd think, hey, now that we have more stuff, we should be more happy. But instead, we're kind of like, why does he have more stuff than yeah, me? Yeah, absolutely. Why did he get to go to Disneyland? Why does he have the perfect dog, the perfect cat, the perfect girlfriend? I have the absolutely. perfect you know, dog. And the comparison game is on. Well, and, and I mentioned school. And when we talk about pressure, I think academic pressure is higher than it used to be. And I think mm -hmm. another unintended consequence of our attention to detail is directly related to technology. This is a tiny bit of a tangent. But, you know, when we were growing up, maybe there was a parent teacher conference once or twice a year and you got a report card at the end of the semester. Right. Right. Now, with technology, I mean, I get a constant, constant stream of texts, of emails, so, sometimes so much that I'm like, good night. I mean, I just I can't even hardly keep up with the school communications. And it's yeah. all, you know in the service of helping our kids pursue excellence. I mean, right. I understand what's going on, but again, it just heightens that sense that everything is under scrutiny constantly and the technology aids and abets that. And I think our kids really feel that pressure too. It is true. We are sort of in this always on, literally Man. always on culture where you're always, you're always exposed to your peers. Yep. You're always exposed to those pressures at school. How do you deal with that as a parent? How do you help your kids sort of cope with these new challenges that come with being a teen today, especially these technological pressures? Well, I'm going to fall back on an answer that, that we've given a lot here. I think it is about conversation and it's about relationship. And mm -hmm. 
sometimes when we want to, you know, put on our parent hat and have parent conversations, our kids are not interested, right? But I think that if we are really trying to cultivate relationship um, and our kids know that they can talk to us and we're not going to fly off the handle about something. And that's key, I think. I think not it's key. flying off the handle. Um, and I think that the boundaries are important. I will confess we're not a particularly boundary-oriented family. We sort of intuit our way through. It's like, hey, we've been on phones enough today. Let's just do something else. You know, we don't have hard and fast time limits and that sort of thing, even though many families do. Um, but I think when we're cultivating relationships, our kids can come to us. And so recently my daughter came to me and she has been, I guess, dating. I, I hesitate to even use that word. <laughs> a boy. <laughs> dating a boy. It's hard for me to say. Um, but he's moved to Germany and it's become a long distance thing. And she shared some things that he had said in a text conversation that she was concerned about. And I was really glad that she felt the freedom to, yeah, that's great. to do that. And I could have said, oh, I can't believe he said that. That's terrible. That's awful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you should cut off the relationship. But I managed to tap the brakes on that response and say, well, Boy, as a dad, that would have been hard. How, how did that make you feel? Yeah. Did that make you feel yeah. valued? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about how you responded to that. Um, and yeah. so I think... Again, there's tons that we've gotten wrong as mm -hmm. parents, but I think that when we're cultivating those relationship spaces, when our kids want to talk, they know they can come to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. No, that's good stuff because I I, it's, I, was, I always talk with parents and, and say, you know, they always go, what do I do when my kid brings me this? What do I do when I find my kid did this? And I, I constantly talk about what, what, what one of the questions I always ask right away is, how old are your kids? You know, and if they're like eight, <laughs> The answer right. is going to be different than if they're 16. Sure. Yeah, right. absolutely. But especially when you get with teen kids, I always tell them to turn it back to them and go, hey, so what do you think you should do? Mm -hmm. You know, just just constantly put it back and not and not and then walk away and let them just do whatever. But, but, you know, just, hey, what do you think you should do? And let them think through. So I love, Adam, what you said. How did that make you feel? You even started a step further yeah. than that is, is empathy. Hey, uh, you know, uh, it, let me listen to what you're feeling and be here with you. I don't necessarily have the answers. The definition of empathy yeah. isn't solve their problems. It's right. I don't have the answers, but tell me how you felt. Wow. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is, but I'm here with you. You know, you know and, that's empathy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, as I'm, I'm thinking through this conversation, we're talking about how all this new stuff, all this technology changes so much about our kids' lives and about our lives yeah. too. But yeah. the one thing that is doesn't change the one thing that that is as close to eternal, if you want to 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 put it that way, is the relationships. Yeah. Right. And and even though parents and teens have so many challenges today, the idea of of having that really strong relationship with your child to to make it so that they can come and talk with you about some of these huge huge challenges, that's really key. And when I think back to my childhood. You know, there. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I I protected my parents from a lot of what was oh, yeah. going on in school. Right? I didn't tell my parents very much because I was worried about them. You know, overreacting. So, in in some ways, I think that even though being a teen can be much harder today, if you have that great relationship with your kids, it can actually be easier because you have those lines of communication open. You know, I think one of the other things that we can do as parents, because I think their peer relationships are more complicated than ours were, mm -hmm. um, geographically, school-wise, sure. that sort of thing. Um, we do, I think, maybe to a fault, um, really try to facilitate our kids' relationships with people. Mm -hmm. And so it may mean that for them to spend time together, if they're not driving yet, you have to drive them across town. Um, mm -hmm. And... Heaven knows I've done plenty of driving in my day, but I think <laughs> anytime my kids actually want to spend time with their friends, um, I want to, for the most part, really be on board with that mm -hmm. because I think that that relational time in general, if they've got good friends that aren't up to bad things, right. you know, is yeah. going to be better than them sitting at home on the phone watching TikTok videos. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. 
face face to face is good. Yeah. And anything we can do, you know, earlier we mentioned, yeah, you know, sometimes with greater privilege comes more budget for extracurricular activities. That comment was made, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it's you know, we don't have to make that a money thing. We don't right. have to put them in, you know, lacrosse, you know, with all the uniforms and the sticks and all the whatever. It could be a drive across town. It could be have your friends over. It could be uh, also face-to-face -face time as a family, yeah, us absolutely. being with them, yeah. us going in, plopping on their floor and saying, oh my gosh, tell me about your day and being a good listener, not lecturing, but, mm. you know, listening instead of lecturing, you know, and having that relationship, the more we create, you know, like, you know, tech-free zones for dinner and mm -hmm. actually, you know, make dinner a priority. Hey, if it's, I remember, man, I was in ministry when my kids were growing up, we were, we were, oh, we <laughs> were, it was mac and cheese or corn dogs. All right. You Which know? is and an ideal like, dinner, what? really. When right. You think it also it explains was. a great, great deal about you. It does. It, it does. And it was, and let me tell you though, but it was all of us at the table, around mm -hmm. the table, and, yeah. and 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 something about those face-to-face -face connections. Um, and I would just add to the Adam the, the driving across town. Sometimes when we didn't know the friends, what we did is we said, "Hey, have them over here." Right. I mean, that's that the old. Our, that's the old safe ground. That's the old youth ministry, you know, sort of go to is make your house the cool house, mm -hmm. right? Make yeah. your house the house kids want to be at. Maybe that means yep. you've got a trampoline. Maybe it means, you know, you've got an 85 inch TV in the basement. You know, I, there are lots of ways that we can sort of make our place the place that kids want to be. And there are so many kids out there whose families are hurting. Mm -hmm. And if we're intentionally creating that environment, not only for our kids, but, you know, kind of a family culture that's a blessing yeah. to others as well. I think that, that, that gets in our kids' DNA and they may not even be aware of it. No, I think that's absolutely well, right. And go ahead, Jonathan. Well, I was just gonna say, and then they can take part of the, it's it's, it's not weird stuff, but they can take part of the family dinner. My, my right. absolutely had totally. yes. friends that had the family dinners yep. and they would say, wow, we never, we never do this. And this was, and and they all had phones and we would, and we would make a big deal of it, but it was just, my kids would be like, oh, by the way, no, there's no phones at the table. You know, they would let them know. So I never had to say, put your phone away, little stranger. You know, <laughs> it was just, it, it was something they knew. And the thing is, That's not creepy they kind at of all. enjoyed it. I think they enjoyed it more than my kids did. They, yeah. My kids were like rolling their eyes and whatever, but Dad. Uh, their friends were kind of, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're kind of enjoying, you know, I've never heard that dad joke. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They've heard all the my dad kids jokes. Are like, my kids are like, he says that every week, <laughs> right? Because that's how dad jokes work. Same so joke. so as we bring this conversation in for landing, well, oh, go ahead. Uh, can we do one more lap around the airport? Let's do one more lap around the it. airport, yes. I brought a visual aid today. All right. You might have noticed. Oh, so I'm currently staying with my in-laws because we're in the process of moving cross country. And I'm staying in my brother-in-law's old bedroom. And because I'm I'm Snoopy and I sometimes notice things, I'm like, huh, I wonder about that. There's a whole pile of magazines. And I was just, I'm like, I wonder what those are. Um, so I started snooping. So you can all judge me right now for being that guy. <laughs> so they were involved in Boy Scouts. Like they were all Eagle Scouts. My wife's whole family, all the, guys, all the boys were Eagle Scouts. And they, my brother-in-law got Boy's Life magazine. And this is May, 1982. And the cover is home computers in your future. <laughs> and I just thought it was telling That's that awesome. as recent as 1982, the idea of a computer in your house was a futuristic idea. Mm -hmm. And so when we reflect on how the culture has changed, I just thought it was like, wow, here we have this, this artifact and on the back, there's an ad for a model building company. <laughs> and I grew up, I don't know about you guys, I loved making models, you know, and I would combine them and make Star Wars models, right? I mean, how many kids today are making models? Probably not as many as back in the day. But anyway, I just thought that was a fun no, it's, little it's fascinating. visual representation of how far we've come in a fairly short time. No, it's it. And really now you can land the land <laughs> land the plane, Paul. Now There's planes plane. on okay. the back. Landing landing gear <laughs> coming out. No, it really is a fascinating thing to think about. Just just how quickly 
the culture has changed. Yeah. And with that change comes some humongous challenges. Yeah. But again, I really resonate with with what you were talking about, Jonathan, in terms of, of having having friends over. You know, when I yeah. look back to my own childhood, um, some of the best memories I have were actually having dinner over at my friend's house or my friend yeah. having dinner over at mine. Those those times when you felt part of another family. Yeah. It, and welcomed. It, and welcomed. It gives you... Kids have always had challenges, right? Yeah. The important thing, I think, for those kids is to feel like they have a port in the storm. Mm. When things are going crazy, when things are going insane in school, when they're not feeling good about about themselves, about how their lives are going, to have that port, mm. that family that you can come to. Be a port. Be a port. That's absolutely right. Mm. Be a port. Because I think that, that that is really the catalyst that can make your teen's life just a little bit easier. Thanks so much, guys. And now a word for our sponsors. You. Well, you've been hearing these youngins yapping for oh, 20, 30 minutes about how hard it is to be a teen these days. Well, I'm here to tell you, they got it easy. Easy, I tell you. Right back in my day, if I wanted to talk to a friend cross town, I had to saddle up old Bessie and ride over myself. Either that or send one of them newfangled telegrams, and that might cost upward of two bits. Who's that? Who's got that kind of money? We didn't have no Facebook or Instagram or that kind of malarkey. No, sir. The only TikTok we had was on the was a clock on the mantel. And that was our entertainment, especially when the radio went down. Me and my 17 brothers and sisters just watched that clock thingamabob go back and forth, back and forth, until it was time to feed the dogs go to bed. Want to know what you can do with your social media? All them screens? Toss them out the back door. Feed them to your dogs, your hogs. Yeah. But if you insist on having screens in your house, well, you, you better know how to deal with them. And that's where these, these youngins, these, uh, the, the plugged-in group here, they, they got a, this book called Becoming a Screen-Savvy Family. It might come in handy. It's got all kinds of tips and tricks to deal with screens and technology and such. And I'm told you, you can get a copy. Now, come here, quick. You can get a copy for practically free. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Just go to plugged-in show homepage, whatever that is, and, and learn how for a gift of any amount, you can get one of these tried and true paper books. Uh, it's a good read, I'm told. So, so, go do it. Now! <laughs> Why, thank you, old man Guster. <laughs> really appreciate that. Uh, you're welcome. <clears throat> you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, welcome to the studio, Mr. Well, Hoos. thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, I understand that you have seen a little movie called Transformers 1. Yes, indeed I have. This is obviously part of a very, very long-running series. The Transformers right. have been around since right. the 1980s. The movies have been around since 2007. Yeah, I think this is number nine, actually. Oh, my of all the goodness. Films. That's Add crazy. So tell me a little bit about Transformers 1. What is going on in this movie? Well, first of all, this one's animated. Oh, Sort of going okay. back to the old days when it was all cartoons. Uh, it's animated, uh, 3D animation, and it's essentially the story of, or the origin story of Optimus Prime and Megatron, which will be two very familiar characters for anybody who knows. Yeah, they're the leaders of the, yeah, the yeah. Autobots and the Decepticons. Right, right. And, and I won't go really much deeper than that, or nor do I need to, because it's essentially this story about how these two were originally, you know, good friends. Mm. They, they met, became friends, almost brothers. And, and then through the course of the story, which I will not reveal, but through the course <laughs> of the story, they, they end up going in separate directions to the point where they become the arch enemies that we know them to be. Mm, very interesting. So there's sort of like an X-Men thing going on. Yes, yes. It's, it's very much like uh, a Professor X and Magneto. Oh, yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. I mean, the, the, that sort of feel mm -hmm. where they start out as good friends and then drift apart. Yeah. So I I have seen a number of Transformers movies yeah. and at least the early ones were not I don't think particularly good. What is mm. this one like? Well, actually this one is lots of fun. Mm. I mean to be really frank, I've I was never a huge 
live action Transformers fan myself. Mm -hmm. I, you know, Michael Bay creating all these bombastic explosions. I mean, some people really got into it. I always thought it was like a lot of explosions with not much else. It you know? just got confusing <laughs> you know? to me. Yeah, honestly. yeah, just a lot of stuff going on. Well, this one is very clear. The story is very upfront. You, In fact, it's it's recognizable in some ways. I mean, you, you understand the idea of friends drifting apart. You understand the idea of, and not only that, but it's, it's big robots, mm-hmm. it, and everybody loves big robots. It's you know? true. And in this particular case, these robots are very well voiced. Uh, it's it's there's there's lots of great animation, and and the voices by by very well known characters or actors like Chris Hemsworth mm. and Scarlett Johansson. Wow! Uh, and, and, uh, Just bringing all the Avengers yeah, this, into, uh, this, into this. Well, movie. sort of like, uh, but they've got a, a full cast of very recognizable actors, and they do a great job with it. I mean, you really they help draw you into the characters and make you care for them. You mm-hmm. know, which in some cases in the in the live action that wasn't the case. Yeah, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Now, one of the problems that we had for parents in the live action movies was, of course, there was a lot of violence, right, yeah. and yeah. some language that you needed to to wade through. Um, what kind of problems do parents need to be aware of with this one? Well, there's still a lot of the exploding action for mm-hmm. sure, but there's nothing drastic. There's nothing. Uh, problematic really i mean mm-hmm. it's just you you go in expecting that there's going to be robots and things zapping each other and getting into big huge battles right but and it, there's no humans in this at no, all it doesn't no, sound like no. so it's all robot on robot right, violence right right but but you don't you don't ever see anything that parents would walk away going mm, boy that was disturbing mm-hmm. nothing like that mm-hmm. there is a little bit of coarse language and mm-hmm. you can read the full plugged in review to get exactly what kind of language and how much of it is there is but th- there's not a, not even in close to as much as you'd find in a typical superhero movie for oh, example that's interesting. it's a pg it's rated pg which some studios really don't like to even make pg movies because they don't think anybody will go see them but the great thing about it is that it, it creates this this movie that you can take your kids to mm. how rare is that you know you can take your whole family to go see this and you don't have, you don't have to worry about any real big problems. Mm-hmm. And I'll say this also: um, there's there are male and female robots, mm-hmm. but there's no romance, and there is no unexpected transformations. Ah, uh, gotcha. You know, just gotcha. to let you know, and that I mean, it's it's all pretty straightforward, and that's the kind of thing that you'd see. The kind of thing that you'd see from Saturday morning cartoons way back when. Really? So that's really kind of interesting. And I, I like the the idea that you were talking about where this might be a good movie to go see as a family. I yeah. Mean, because you have parents who probably grew up with these Transformers. Right. Uh, bringing their own kids to maybe not introduce them to, to their favorite toys, but sort of it almost feels like a throwback type of a thing to when you were watching Saturday morning cartoons. Right. Or Only whatnot. with far better graphics mm-hmm. and and visuals and really nice uh, characterization and music. I mean, it's a really, all all across the board, a really nice and appealing movie. Well, that's refreshing. And I think, you know, you were talk, talking about parents being connected. I think that is probably a big part of why this particular medium has continued. You know, mm-hmm. the whole Transformer idea. You think about it now, it's been, it's been since the mid-80s that it started with the toys. And by the way, my favorite aspect of the whole thing was the toys. I thought kids could really get into toys because it made it put play on a different level. Sure. Not only were you dealing with big robots, but you were dealing with with vehicles that they could transform into. Mm-hmm. But I, I but I think the longevity of this particular um, genre and this particular series has been because there been it's been there for so many years, and and anybody in their forties and younger has some kind of attachment. Sure. To this, this, you know, yeah, yeah. It's incredible how brand. these these franchises just they continue, and and they really can become if the the products are good. Yeah. They can become a, a conduit, if you will, for connection across generations. Yeah, and, and and they hear the name Transformers and they think, well, maybe we should go see this one. Maybe it'll be good. And in this case, it is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Hoos. You bet. 
All right, and now it is time for my favorite segment of this entire podcast. And I'm actually going to turn this over to Adam just because I like the interaction. Well, now brought to us by our producer, Ashley. Hey, Ashley. Hey, Adam. (laughs) Is a game we call Pop Culture Connection. (laughs) Ashley, take it away. All right. So I'm going to have Paul go first. Oh, good. This is my 80s toy edition. Oh. Since we're talking Transformers. All right. So, Paul, He Man, Master of the Universe, or Mm. Thundercats? Oh, man, you know what? I am going to go with Masters of the Universe mm. because you've got the, the big old castle. I love the castle's gray skull. Skeletor was super cool. He-Man was awesome, although just a little too muscular. From You know, it was, it was kind of weird when you think about it. No, but it the Battle Cat was really awesome. Very, very neat. Uh, it had a better TV show. Let's yeah. be honest with you. Yep. Thundercats wow. was kind of a lame TV show. I, I think I think that that like you had this whole little family saving the universe. You only had like fifteen characters you had to worry about. I and guess we're at time. It. My nice bell beat. didn't ding, but Paul, right was, time, Paul so. was lost in 1982, <laughs> yeah. right there. Yeah, I, I really yeah. wanted. I wanted to live in Castle Skeleton. I, yes. I so and I, now I sort of do. I would walk over Not to crazy. my best friend's house in the morning before school, and we would walk to school together. And it was on in the morning. It felt like it was on after school, and it was just a part <laughs> of our life rhythm. Yeah, and it had a cool mm, movie. Man. It was beautiful. See, for me, the, the thing that was part of my, my life was Inspector Gadget. I oh, yeah, walk Inspector Gadget. over uh, to my friend's house every nice. morning before we yeah. went to school, and I would actually show up early yep. just so I could sit in their living room and watch Inspector Gadget. Go, 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 Gadget. Gadget. Arms. May return after these messages. Eight points, Paul. Good job. Thank you very much. Beat that, Jonathan. All right. He will. I, I doubt it. I don't know. This is not. I literally, I'd have never seen Thunder. I couldn't have even answered. I would have, and I didn't watch He Man, so I would have been, I would have been up Sad. short on that one. I would oh have just boy, had to you would have had to like Cats ask hole. Thundercats. Oh, yes. yeah, never seen Lion-O, I have Chitara, no idea what about. the whole gang, right? Yeah. Yes. All yeah. right. Never so Jonathan, it. I've got one that you may never have heard of, but oh, one that you have. So, okay, good. I'll take Go that bots, one. Go bots, or Transformers. Oh, that's and easy. why. Okay, I've never seen either, so I'm oh. going to go for it. Transformers, because they turned into a Michael Bay film, which was amazing, that had Megan Fox <laughs> and Jack Blue. It was a terrible and, uh, movie. And they also movie. can turn from a car. It was a terrible movie. Turn from a car to a robot, back to a car go or a truck. Did too. And they made great commercials. And they had a song that was super catchy. And my friends all played with them, but I didn't because I wasn't allowed to. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was a cartoon. <laughs> oh. <laughs> This nice. week, so Jonathan, you weren't allowed to play with Transformers. No, they're from the devil, clearly. I, I literally didn't. No, I, I just wasn't. No, I, I probably shouldn't say. That. I just did. I truly. I don't remember if that's one of the ones that wasn't allowed, but we didn't watch the cartoon. I mean, they we were wow. so Decepticons. My exposure to Transformers Autobots and Decepticons. Was, yeah, was was Michael Bay. That was it. And yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. What an impoverished wow. childhood. I'm so sorry. How did I do for faking it, Ashley? I you got six points, man. Oh, oh see, I set you up to job. win. Now the pressure's on I'm, me. Yeah. I'm for knowing lead. nothing. For knowing nothing. Wait, how many did Paul get? I, I got, got eight. 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 Oh, yeah. Yes. Count them. Okay. Yes. I'll take three quarters. All right. <laughs> Count them. <laughs> As I lay them before your eyes. Eight. Here we go. Spread them Action out. figures. I'm ready. This is a tough one for me, especially, it's but not. I don't think it'll be hard for no, you. No, it's the answer right. Star Wars. <laughs> oh, my goodness. G.I. <laughs> oh, Joe or Star Wars? Uh, Star Wars, no. yeah. I mean, <laughs> Star Wars because Star Wars, right? There were more of them. There oh. were so many spaceships. You could get anything. Millennium Falcon was the best gift I ever got, ever. They're now worth thousands of dollars on the aftermarket. Your dad threw them away, though, so now you have to go to therapy <laughs> to deal with your daddy issues. Um, they had different, like four different ones for every character, and they had characters. You could actually learn the names of characters. You had no idea what their this name was because of the little Kenner cardboard things, right? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking Not about. Not you. Yeah. Yeah. I also like the little slidey light sleeve oh, yeah. came out of the oh, arm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Okay. How many did okay, I get? Okay, listeners. Seven. Listeners, let's be oh, honest. Oh, Paul wins. I yeah, win. It felt, yeah, it felt yeah. like more than that. How did how did you win with a major league pitch when Adam got that lob? I know. That was a, definitely a softball <laughs> I mean, question. I thought. Was, but the thing was, he got so excited about talking about Star Wars I that know, he forgot I, to. I wasted time. Yes. Yeah. So my yeah. wife had the Dagobah set. 
It was super cool. Wow. Really cool. Two words. Millennium Falcon. Yeah, she had that too. Oh See, I'm a big G.I. Joe positive. fan because they were articulated. The yeah, Star Wars were, were just were very stiff. But, but the, the G.I. Joes <laughs> were weird, right? Because those were like at that point... They were the ones from like the 1960s that had like the the yeah. fake beard, and I'm like, ooh, that's creepy. I didn't like. Oh, uh, yeah. 80s GI Joes were awesome though. <laughs> okay, I didn't have Come any on, 80s GI Joes. Oh, I just sad. Like we launched them on fireworks, probably. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right, before before this conversation goes completely off the rails, no, we're there. We're gonna we're gonna bring this entire entire plane in for a landing. Thank you so much for joining us. And listeners, we invite you to join in the conversation. We'd love to hear and about your... And let us your... know if you save your grease. <laughs> <laughs> or if you still have your Star Wars figures. Or if you That's still right. have your Star Wars figures. Did you, you sell them all? your Star Wars figures in grease. <laughs> and light them on fire. Like Toy Story, gone bad. <laughs> exactly. Grab it, Paul. Grab it quick. You can, you can answer legitimate questions, too. Like, tell us whether you think it's harder to be a teen today and why. We would love to hear from you about any and all topics. So feel free to chime in on Instagram, on Facebook. Leave us a voicemail on our homepage or write us an email at teamsattheplugedinshow.com. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll be talking about sad, sad movies oh, next week. Sad. Old Yeller? Oh, man. We're going to talk about Maybe. Old Yeller? Maybe. We'll see. Oh, that wow. movie. All right. Thanks so much, and join us again on The Plugged In Show. 